energy coming from within is so strong. It flows out to the beings around us. They're dazzled and happy. They feel grateful. We feel grateful. Lightning beings feel happy. We sort of drop out, take pity on ourselves, give ourselves a break from all our pressures. <laughs> Then when we feel this pity on ourselves, of course, we look around us in our mind's eye. We see all the beings, and by now we know that they're all our mothers in previous lives. And they will again be our mothers, in fact. And so we want to do whatever we remember the kindness of our mother of this life. We wish to repay that kindness and make them happy the way our mothers of this life made us happy. They could be surrogates if we have a particular biography. It doesn't matter how our mother of this life may have actually behaved. Although most of us wouldn't be as well as we are if they hadn't done, had some core of sweetness toward us. And then we love them and wish them to be happy. I'm not wanting to possess them, but one just wanting them to be happy. We feel compassion for them, wishing them to be free of suffering. We resolve we will be the ones to help them become free of suffering. And then we resolve we will become a Buddha since we couldn't really help them to be free of suffering until we fully nirvana embodying ourselves as a Buddha. So then we develop a spirit of enlightenment called the bodhicitta, the soul of enlightenment, the enlightenment soul based on the vow to affirm our interconnection, infinite interconnection with all beings from the past and into the future, in such a way that we say, well, we might as well vow to sooner or later see to it that all the beings we're interconnected with should be free of suffering, and should be blissful and happy. And when we receive that, then it's the sort of like the, we are simulating the, taking the vow of the Bodhisattva the messianic vow to become a Buddha for the sake of all beings. And ironically, although that seems to be in some level of world picture, the most impossible possible task that you can think of. And it's even almost a frightening thing to, to really take such a vow because it makes us feel from our own cultural background like we'd have to be a martyr, we have to immolate ourselves or something. In some way. Ironically, when we really adopt such a resolution to live for others, become a being that is but living for others, which is what a Buddha is. It feels like a tremendous joy about it. It's like our heart sort of flips inside out and we suddenly feel connected to all beings and we feel the great joy of the possibility of their, of their joy. And then, when we think of this, then we get the light circle, the figure eight of the light from the beings above to us, from us to the beings around, back from them to us and back up to the beings above. We just get even more bright and brilliant, more intense. The heat of the sun is simulating that. Fit that in with the heat of the sun. Then, then we turn to, well, now how do we get to be a Buddha? turn our mind toward that. And then we realize that just wishing beings to be free of suffering through great compassion of the suffering, just wishing ourselves to be free of suffering through the renunciation, giving ourselves a break from our lesser aims and objectives. Just the wish by itself it won't do the trick. We have to understand the reality. Buddha said to us, that when we understand our true reality of selflessness, emptiness, voidness, we would actually feel this freedom and bliss would well up within, ecstatic bliss beyond anything we can imagine, any kind of worldly bliss. But he said to us that he and all the members of his tradition also said that when we first hear that, we don't necessarily believe that. We can't imagine it. We feel like, we first of all, we feel we have a self, strong self, strong sense of self. I'm really me, we feel. If somebody comes and says, you're not you, we get like offended. When Buddha comes and says, you're not really you, we don't like it even. We feel it's a challenge. 
So that's important that we admit that to ourselves and we reconcile that. that not, but it doesn't want us to say, oh yes, but we believe you, oh yes, I'm so selfless. That doesn't help. That will almost make us nihilistic, rather, as if we didn't exist at all. He wants us to find in ourselves that sense of, I really am the real me. And then he wants us to affirm that we are very practical and we have common sense. We believe in what we see in front of us and what we find and what works for us. We infer from our past experience what will work in our future experience. And therefore, if we are this self that we feel we are, this real self, solid, self-existing, self-subsisting, self-substantial self, then if we look for it very substantially and subsistently and absolutely, we will find it. And if we don't find it, we are going to have to then really rethink the way we are wired up. So we make that kind of commitment about our practical mind. And then we look into ourselves, turn our gaze inward, look in our body. Is there a real Bob inside my body? Is it any part of my body? Is it the whole of my body? If I lose a piece of my body, is there no more Bob? Very quickly I begin to realize there's no Bob in my body. I think Bob, my body is, my body is Bob. Let me look at my, I look at all my sensations of pleasure and pain and so forth. None of them are me. That real me that I feel is so absolutely. The, the sensations are evanescent, they come and go. They fluctuate. I look at my notions. Well, I have a notion of an absolute me, of course, that's what I'm holding on to. But none of the notions themselves are absolute. Now I think of it, now I don't think of it. It doesn't seem to stay fixed in me. So we reject that it's a notion. Then we look at my emotions. I have an emotion of anger, determination, self-assertion. But they come and they go. They're not fixed. They're related to circumstances and things. None of them are a real Bob. Finally, I look at my consciousness. I look for like a point that's like a sort of photographic film in a camera or a digital storage thing. Somewhere where the sense of Bob accepts and perceives everything and thinks everything. Is there a little Bob inside that speaks in a voice in my mind's ear that I'm thinking aloud inside my mind? I sort of hear it in my own voice, or is it really my own voice? Looking more carefully, the different voices I hear inside begin to pluralize and, and, and they like shred, they fall apart, they deconstruct, and I begin to realize there's no Bob in consciousness. There's no point of awareness that's labeled Bob. But when I do this though, this is tricky because it is my consciousness looking for my consciousness. And as I look and look and look and look there, turn on myself, turn on myself, like the dog spinning, like a dizzying kind of chasing of a tail, made Chris uncomfortable, and that's a good sign, and Bob chasing Bob chasing Bob chasing Bob, like a dog chasing its tail inside the very core of my consciousness, and this is very difficult to maintain focus on this without veering off into distracting thoughts. But when I can do that, then... I don't sort of break off and say, well, it's just that I don't exist, or make some sort of slogan out of it. Keep pushing to find, and keep failing to find, and keep not finding the failing. And then what happens is I begin to melt. The sense of self that's looking, this, the illusion of self that feels like it should be being looked for, both of them seem to melt, subject and object. And I seem to melt. And I can even be afraid of this melting as if I'm going to pass out and get dizzy. Or I can revel in it like it's a bursting free, like it's a blissful melting, like an ecstatic, even orgasmic melting. Where I just let go of everything. And yet it is me letting go. So then it becomes then a new relational me emerges. But let's go and let's go, and that relational me somehow becomes empty and free and spacious and even infinite like it was infinite space and there's not even any thought of me or mind and yet I feel one with the infinite space I am the infinite space I don't think anything I don't have any thoughts anymore in my mind I'm so too vast for thought 
there would be no agent of Fort Old's base would be there, although thoughts may be around, but they're not appropriate. So then I enter in what is called the space-like equipoise samadhi, in which there's room for everything, sounds, goddesses dancing, singing songs, click clacking, people chatting, whatever. It's all vast space. And I melt it into all of that. And it is a soaring freedom that I feel. And I have the first taste of self direct experiential understanding of selflessness, they say, like water being poured in water, the subjectivity meaning the objectivity of ultimate reality, like water poured in water. Plunging deep and emerging with water poured into it. Water from a spout or something. And then maybe something in me asserts itself and says, well, I am this infinite space. And then, so that infinite space is my real self. That's the absolute real self. And then, when, however, the momentum of one's critical looking, the drill that one developed by spinning, says, well, where does this infinite space, without saying it, and it looks to kick a hole of the infinite space and confirm that that's the absolute. And of course, infinite space is not, it's itself empty of itself. It's, it is infinite, therefore, it's not something that is, it can be divided from something that is not in. Infinite is everywhere. So it's not something that I just entered and left the world to go into. The feeling that I left differentiated things and moved into infinite space is itself a delusion and therefore infinite space gets itself out of the way of all the interconnected things. And then I'm in the dreamlike aftermath samadhi, where I am both this infinite space, and I am all the beings, and yet they are different from me and they're different from each other, and we have all this beautiful play of differentiation. On one level, the five ruby, jewel, ruby, diamond, emerald, sapphire, topaz, jewel, colored, pure energy is a bliss in the universe. On the other hand, the differentiated beings, the not inanimate objects as well, the dogs, the cats, the other people, the Tibetans, the Americans, the Nepali, the Indian, the Bhutanese, the cats, the cockroaches, the mice, whatever it is. All of that is all there in a way, it's all me, and yet I also can be, make my separate experience of it and contribution to it without ever losing my sense of infinity. This is the non-dual integration. of true freedom. True freedom, which is not only wisdom of selflessness, as if that were some sort of achievement of a state of extinction, where you just simply lost yourself in vastness, but the wisdom of the truth of selflessness that is simultaneously the compassion, the bliss that is the compassion for all those who lack that bliss, who feel that they themselves are there and they need something else than themselves who fear something else than themselves, who are struggling still with the universe, seeking to flee from it, to overcome it, to conquer it, however one reacts to the sense of being separate from the universe, to, well, inevitably, inadequately. So this wisdom knows that I am one with them, and we and they, I and they are all in infinite space together. And the compassion recognizes that they don't feel that way, and therefore wishes to create art, open the imagination, create teaching, create demonstration, create whatever it is that will open their imaginations to being more than they thought they were, to being more connected than they habitually think they are, to being less disconnected and alienated than they used to feeling they are. So it's wisdom and compassion non-dually indivisible. And then compassion, remember, when compassion meaning the will to free others from suffering, the will that they rise above their suffering and discover their inner bliss, or they go beneath their suffering and discover their inner essence of bliss. So therefore to be a f compassion is not therefore remain content with just being a wish. I wish they would just do that, turn their mind inward, free themselves from this illusory suffering that they suffer. In order to really convey that to that feeling of compassion has to transform itself into bliss. 
and has to radiate that bliss toward them to reinforce their inner feeling of bliss. But then we get wisdom, bliss indivisible, which is true creativity.